Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Wednesday morning. There it is. Chair dancing. Made it. Hello to everybody in the chat. As I mentioned in my post early, this is like a um, picture postcard winter day outside. Four inches. For the Americans, three or four inches of snow. Uh, for the rest of the world, eight to ten centimeters in ah. my yard. Looking very pretty, anyway. And now I realize I got to do all my uh, holiday shopping still. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can report zero inches of snow in San Diego so far today, but we'll see. It, it could happen. Yeah, it could happen. <laughs> it could happen. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we have just as much uh, snow in Arizona. So it's all good. <laughs> I get it. There, there, who's uh, that crazy voice hanging out with us today, Chris? Folks, we have uh, BJ Shoney joining us for the first time ever. Um, very excited to have you here uh, for a great, what we hope will be a great conversation. We know it will be a great conversation. Chris, get off the fence. Commit to it. Gosh darn it. <laughs> <laughs> BJ, it is your first time with us. Uh, introduce yourself to our folks and our friends here today. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. BJ Shoney. So nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I've been working in learning and development, playing all kinds of different roles for, I don't know, 15, lots of years. And uh, it's just been a really fun field. I've always enjoyed chatting with folks like Brent at conferences and, and learning from other folks. And uh, yeah, I've just worked across a bunch of different companies, a lot of tech companies, done everything from running teams. I've done the one person L&D mm -hmm. department. I've done that. Uh, and right now I work at LaunchDarkly, a pretty exciting software uh, tech company. And I run the customer education and partner education team there. So that's the quick version of the bio mm -hmm. right there. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we're talking today, you've mentioned all the different kinds of roles and, 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 and situations you've been in. Mm -hmm. um, and we are talking today about, you know, so some of the differences really maybe in, in some of the things we need to be aware of if you're, if you're working with external learners mm -hmm. versus internal learnings. Because a lot of L&D departments, we are, you know, we're doing the, the trainings for, for internal learning those are you know the safety stuff that we've got to cover the you know other competencies in internally um but things get a little bit different if you're dealing with uh you know folks who aren't part of your your organization for instance um you can't send them all a, a message via the lms and say you must take this by december right. 31st or whatever right. you know <laughs> i don't know maybe you can we could we can try it okay take yeah a note, take a yeah note. um but 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so when, when you when you first shifted from you know being an uh, working with an internal audience to an external audience, what were some of the I guess first things that you you found that were different or or, or needed to to think about and sort yeah, out? Yeah, absolutely. So we're in a, uh, the company launched Arco. We we have a, a product that essentially helps software development teams uh, be a little more intelligent on in how they manage and release software. So think about it: if you're ready to roll out new software. You can push it to production and cross your fingers and hope it works. Or using a tool like ours, you can push the code to production and the, use what we call feature flags, which are like light switches to say, all right, we're going to turn on this one feature for like 10% of our audience and see how it goes. And if it blows up, we quickly turn off that light switch. Uh, or if it works well, we, we gradually roll out the software. So in our case, we're pretty lucky that you know, if a company has become a customer, they're excited or interested in using the technology. It's a fairly new type of technology, uh, our, our platform. So the users, the, the developers in many cases may not have had exposure to it. And it is something they need to learn. And they are excited. They've spent money on it. They're ready to try this out, see how it can help them do their jobs better and release code without freaking out or waking up in the middle of the night for an emergency rollback or something like that. So <laughs> what a really lucky position to where in this case, with this company that that it's it's training that people are really interested in and we're not having to force it upon them because it's more of a pull. So 
right, right. It was it was one of the things I looked for in looking at, at kind of my next role that I wanted it to be this kind of a circumstance instead of the typical traditional, mm -hmm. I were from HR, you're going to take this now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and for, it sounds like then for the folks that, that you're, you're working with, they they're they're keen on the change to a new system or a new tool because they've had pain and the tool is going to solve pain. So I can totally see that. Yeah. Well, making my life better. I will listen to, I, I will take the training. I will learn this thing because uh, I can, I can clearly see, Oh, what's in it for me. Oh, exactly. Ah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no kidding. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not, not everybody um, makes this transition in their career, which is why I thought it would be an interesting conversation to have for, for multiple reasons. One, it's, a, it's another way to introduce folks to other options mm -hmm. as in their career as instructional designers, as corporate trainers. But the other reason was just because of all the layoffs and everything going on, mm -hmm. I thought it might also be, it, it make people feel good that there is another option out there. You don't have to just be looking for those HR internal training types of jobs. You you can use mm -hmm. your skill set and venture out into the world of software startups and customer mm -hmm. training and and all that kind of stuff um but my guess is there are some differences between the two whether subtle or extreme and as somebody who's gone through that process i'm sure you've uh, hit a roadblock or two here and there <laughs> yeah yeah well i would say yes but it's honestly been a really refreshing change. And it, it has maybe in my case, I've just been really lucky and, and it's gone very well. And I've got a, a fantastic team that has rolled out some some great work. So I'd say the biggest difference is, um, you know, in, in internal, I always felt that there was so much more connection to broader talent programs. Maybe you're working in, 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 in coordination with the talent management team or HR or, or your business stakeholder. And, and there felt like, for my, in my experience, there was so much interweaving of your work and what you were rolling out, what you were designing, what you were building in, in complex work with weaving things together to work naturally and work well with all of those other pieces and parts of the internal organization. Moving over to the customer education side, it's a lot more straightforward in that it's you're teaching more direct skills. We need you to learn how to do X. Here's the training to do X. <laughs> <laughs> so that part is a lot more direct. So the training itself, I'm not going to call it simple. It's still really complex technical training, but the, the concept is really straight to here's what you got to do. Where I think the complexity lies uh, is you need to still coordinate across different teams like engineering, product, customer support, customer success, because everyone needs to be on the same page because you don't want your customers to read one thing in the training they submit a support ticket and support tells them, why are you doing it that way? You should be doing it this way. <laughs> um, Oops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or product says, product says, why are you using the tool like that? It wasn't meant to be used like that. So there's, there is coordination, but I find it to be a little bit more direct and clear cut. And you do have to kind of work to build that alignment. And there's a little politics involved there. Um, but to me, maybe it's just because I'm in a honeymoon period. It's been mm -hmm. a, little, a little clearer, a little easier to navigate. And I've really enjoyed it. So it's been a really good switch for me. You know, um, I mean, you're still dealing with subject matter experts and, uh, you, you know, uh, but all, all of those other things that that we do internally, you know, as well. Mm -hmm. But I do find that, um, oh, surprise, guys, Domino's a software company. Um, so, you know, a lot of what we do is software related training, you know, sure. helping clients. We can relate. We can yeah. relate to a lot of what you're saying. Um, yeah. And, and in, in a lot of cases, that kind of training is. Um, it's a lot more, ob it's often obvious what you have to teach, right? How do I do this? Here's right. how you do this, right? What are right. the things you right. need to do? Here's how you do them. Yeah. So in, in some ways it's, it's um, um, it, it, in some ways it simplifies the process, certainly of, of um, instructional design, et cetera. It does. In, in some cases uh, in previous roles, I was put in a position where we have a large, large team and a large budget. We need your help with training hundreds of managers on these four important skills and we're going to give you two hours of their time over the quarter and it's like i really struggled with that and then if i felt like i really had to dig my heels in and justify either more time or whatever resources it, it might be i was fighting an uphill battle mm -hmm. and i that that's that can wear you down over time i felt like uh, in mythology sisyphus rolling the, 
<laughs> the rock up the hill. There were so many times it felt like that. And I, I remember I had a moment looking out my kitchen window of like, I really did kind of the internal math on external facing education, more product type training, but more in a technical sense. And, and I really thought like, this is an area I want to pursue. And so far it's been a, a really great switch. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, sometimes those kinds of, yeah, as you say, if you've got two hours every quarter, it, it's, it's sort of like, okay, everybody gather up. We're just going to sprinkle the holy water. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, yeah. Everybody exactly. splash a little training on. Okay, get get back to work. Right. That's it. Yeah. Isn't exactly. isn't that how it works? Does it isn't that effective? <laughs> so speaking of uh, effective, um, I know mm -hmm. there's probably some folks here that are uh, diehard data and analytics Ooh. folks, and right there's a we um, we're very focused in our industry now on making sure we can, uh, you know the doing, right? We, we can, you know, monitoring that, that the training we've done has had an impact on the business, right? And the analytics is, does that change at all from shifting from internal to external? I mean, it's the eternal debate, right? And it's the thing that, that is always difficult to answer. So I'll answer it in a couple different ways and then we'll, we'll kind of circle it and see, see how we feel. So first of all, in more of the, the revenue side of the world and you're, you're selling something to a customer and you want to train them on how to use it, um, what we're doing at LaunchDarkly, it's really important to understand that entire customer journey from the moment they've never heard of our product to, hey, what is that product? I'd like to read about it, learn about it. And there's the whole you know, officially defined stages of this customer journey where they get engaged with the company, where they reach out for info, where they get a demo, make, you know, consideration, the whole thing. And we step back and we look at each of those stages from a learning standpoint, and we kind of uh, attach either moments or activities of where we think we can help. What's cool about that is all of the different, you know, the, the sales forces of the world and all the different systems that are used to kind of keep an eye on and work through those journeys um, makes the data part pretty easy to at least see, you know, we have 200 customer, potential customers or prospects at this stage, and then you move on to this stage. So there's all these opportunities. So we have that data. So we can start to think about what folks move forward and what folks don't go forward and what things they might've touched or what training they might've looked at. So that's one thing that, that we look at. We're also super keen to look at our trained versus non-trained customers. So who took the training, who didn't. Mm -hmm. And then once you do that, you can look at things like, okay, support tickets, the customers that went through our training, how many support tickets did they submit versus those that didn't? That's interesting. We can look at renewals, customers that renew, were they more likely or less likely to have gone through our training? We're still very early. I've been, uh, we launched our Launch Darkly Academy about two months ago. So we're a little early to, to really have a definitive answer, but these are the types of things we'll look at. Um, yeah, let's see here. Uh, you've got CSAT, NPS, those types of typical things that you look at to understand if people and you know like the training. Um, CSAT for the product. So if people were trained versus not trained, do they have a higher satisfaction level with the product? And then you have anecdotal data. You have things like um, in one of our first pilots, we got a, we captured a quote from a pilot user that said, after going through the training, had I known that these features were available, we would have upgraded our account earlier. Hmm. And you take a quote like that and, and you package it with all the other information you're, you're pulling together. And that, that can be pretty powerful, pretty compelling. When you get into skill transfer, they, they took the training. Did they learn the thing? Can you prove it? Can you show it? We're doing as much as we can to inclu include labs um, within our training. So we say, here's the training. Here's what it looks like. Here's what you should be able to do. All right, your turn. Get into the lab. Go create a feature flag. Test it. Try it. And I would say we're in the early stages of, of figuring that out where w the one challenge we're running into is some of the lab technology functionality uh, functionality doesn't always report the exact behavior to say like, okay, Chris went through this lab. We know he went through it, he got to the end, but did he really do everything exactly 100% right? Mm -hmm. So that's where we're kind of sitting right now. So we'll get yeah. there, but I think we're, we're on the right path at, you know, I think looking at the right data, I think our, our LMS and the CRM type systems are going to give us a lot of data. It's now up to us to make sense of it and try to tell our story. 
for sure. Um, so something something that you mentioned there that caught, and I want to take us to is the, you know, the pre-sale thing because we think of maybe training with the kind of products that that we offer that, that it's oh now you now you know you're going to start using the tool so now we're going to you know train you so tell us a little bit more about how you how you um, you know and the the training piece of what you're doing fits into the the pre-sale like. You're obviously not saying to people, oh, you're wondering about this? Here, take this course in the LMS. <laughs> or, I'm presuming that's not how it's done, but maybe it is. But you know, how do you how do you think about that? I would say our, our onboarding path, if you will, or kind of that information to onboarding path is it's in its version 1.0 right now, and we're having a lot of conversations about it. But what what I believe we're seeing is that you know, in the LMS, we do have an eight-minute video. Uh, it's an on-demand video of launch darkly for beginners. And people go through that. And then we also do live Q&A office hours sessions that people okay. can sign up for. And they don't need to be customers. That can be anybody interested in the product. Mm -hmm. And then we do have our product education and all of our training available to the public for free. So we oh, really okay. just do encourage people to get out there and take it, try it, test it, and kick the tires. And use a trial account. And, and they can just see if they like it, see if it's a good fit. Brilliant. The only yeah, thing this we is plan where. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, this is this is where obviously marketing and training gets connected, right? We've had a yeah. lot of, of of different sessions on Idiotic with folks talking about that, right? How how we can yeah. learn from marketing and marketing can learn from us. And this, this is where I think people can start to see those connections, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's an area I'm really excited to explore. We have a really strong technical marketing team. They actually run our YouTube channel with really great content. So there's going to be a natural relationship, natural mm -hmm. fit there. So yeah, there's a lot to figure out, but so far, it feels pretty promising. Oh, very cool. Yeah, uh, um, I, I, I'm going to guess too, just from what I, you know, what you've described there. Not only are people getting a reassurance of the tool, but they're getting a reassurance that there's, um, you know, support and backup you yeah. know, for the use of the tool. They're getting not just the ticking the boxes. Okay, yes, it does this, it does that, but also, you you know, we're not going to flounder. We've got this. You, you know, there's something here for us to make sure that we are successful too. That's which is an implicit sales, you know, angle too, right? So it is absolutely. And, and we're hearing really, really positive feedback. People have gotten really excited about this, which was a very pleasant surprise to see that. Mm. So yeah, it's been really nice. They, I think they do feel really supported. Very cool. Yeah, because yeah, on so internal training departments, people don't often get excited about the training that they have to take. <laughs> I know, I know. Exactly. And, and this is also probably part of just knowing your audience, right? Because the folks who are doing this have a particular pain and they need reassurance, you know, before they commit to the tool mm -hmm. that it's going to, you know, solve a pain. They're technical people, so they're prepared to dig in, right? They're yeah. going to roll up their sleeves and um and, and so yeah crossing that that's 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 just part of the the convincing process to yep. you know have them have them sign on the dotted line in that kind of a way yeah, there, yeah there's michelle an says i'm in oh sorry I, I was just gonna we'll go to the chat real quick and just say I, michelle mentions i'm in product marketing so we are the bridge between product and marketing nice nice yeah there's there's a lot of relationships to tap into like that and, and to pull together and another relationship is with our documentation team we have our docs, mm. te you know, technical docs are the, the holy grail for technical folks that are using an, a product. They typically just say, forget the training, I just want to go to the documentation. <laughs> and I understand that. Like, if I can do a command F or control F find on a site, chances are I can probably figure it out. Um, so we've had to kind of carefully talk through what is that relationship between documentation and training. And the way that we say it is that documentation, or sorry, training is is for those initial key moments, especially onboarding or really teaching about a brand new concept, brand new feature or functionality. Docs, the documentation site, is you kind of know what you're doing, and you just need to look up a quick answer or a quick. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, yeah sure. product marketing, docs, those are all relationships you have to kind of build and, and stitch together. Right. Oh, and and I, what you're saying there aligns very much with like the five moments of need. Um, you know. Formal training for learning new things or learning change, yes. um, but other things like performance support, which you know documentation plays a role in, et cetera, in in terms of helping refine knowledge or confirming and or applying things. That you know those sort that combination of things too. Yeah. Exactly. And then for those folks that don't uh, aren't familiar with the five moments of need, that's Bob Mosier and our friend yes. Conrad Godfordson. That yeah. uh, you guys can can Google it if you want to and. Uh, 
and learn about the five moments of need from those two fabulous guys. I think they have lots of blog posts about it and whatnot. Hey, I noticed we got a couple questions also in uh, the chat. I think while uh, maybe Chris or somebody is grabbing that link and putting it into the chat to the five moments of need, um, there's a, a question got voted up to the top. So I think that's it comes from Buddy. And I'm going to click the start answering. Well, I'm going to read it first. Uh, what do you see are the differences between training customers on your product versus selling training, corporate university type, where your training is actually the product? Both are external training, but the intent goal is a bit different. And I think this is a great question, especially for you, BJ, because yeah. if I remember correctly, in your past, you do have some experience creating training as a product. Yes. Am I wrong? Some, a little, but most most was just internal L and D. But I've 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 had some experience there. But I would say specifically for where I am now, for this role, the way that I get paid, the way that I get a paycheck, is if launched darkly, my company makes money by selling software, and the more people that buy our software and renew their licenses with with launched darkly, the more money we make. So our focus has been. Let's not worry about selling our training. Let's give it free. We want people to become really proficient, really big fans. We want to empower them and help them go off and be strong users of our product. Therefore, the rest of those things happen and I get my paycheck. Uh, being you know, sarcastic, obviously, but we, we see there's way more value in that as far as the success, yeah. of the company, success of the company goes. Selling training, there's absolutely value in that in, in, in certain models and you know, certain industries where that, that seems to have been kind of pre-established that fits really well. Uh, there's like a giant, you know, certification industry. We do, uh, we did decide to sell our certifications. So we've launched a bronze and silver developer certification. Bronze is free, silver we are charging for, and it's just $150, it's not too, too much. Um, but we really did go with the philosophy of we'd rather get our stuff out there because of the long-term effect that it has mm -hmm. for the success of the company. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. There's there's other situations and scenarios where selling the training as the product makes more sense for that organization and how that uh, how they might be structured or the field they're in. So yeah, just different ways of approaching it. Yeah, the thing that always struck me about the difference between those two was you're not necessarily when you're selling training, creating training as a product. You don't always necessarily know the audience. You you can generalize depending That's upon right. what the training product is, right? But but you but you may not know specifics. So you have to be very general in the content and the instructional design and and what you build. Whereas in your situation, right, you're developing training for direct customers of a right. particular product and with Chris and I and, and the yeah. other SaaS companies, right? It's very targeted. And when you're internal, you know, your employees, you know, yeah. what the work they're trying to do, right? You, you understand that customer For sure. building that product. You got to kind of be generic. Yeah. And we're both looking oftentimes at what is the best way to get to a successful organization that is performing well, right? Mm -hmm. Just kind of different approaches and different angles. Yep. Yep. I, I, I think that's where the, uh, uh, I'll just click done answering here. Um, but I, I think that's where um, having editable content, I think, is really good. So be, being able to um, build those those training as a product, right, it, and but making it editable so that people can go in and then they they can add the stuff that is, you know, you buy it, get yourself 80% of the way there, and then you can make some adjustments to it to target your specific audience. That makes you know, a lot we've, of sense. We've yeah. seen that becoming becoming a thing, uh, you know, over the last few years. And it's, uh, I, I think it's an incredibly effective and efficient way for people to spin up, but not be stuck with something too generic. So makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's do another answer question in the chat here. What sort of metrics do you target with your customer education program? I guess we already answered that a little bit, but maybe go a little deeper for us. Yeah, really just trying to compare the trained audience or trained customers versus those that haven't gone through any form of training. And we want to look at um, their satisfaction with with our SaaS product, with Launch Dark. We want to look at uh, how many support tickets they've submitted, how often um, you know, what's their renewal percentage, renewal rate, uh, time to value from the moment they sign the contract until they've heard, had that first 
you know, key moment of, you know, I hate to use a term value realization, but like the first moment they've really gone in and added feature flags and uh, switched over from their previous model of how they deliver software. So that, you know, what is that time from which they signed the contract until they got the value? Does training help us shrink that time down? So it's really just kind of comparing um, all that info. And I think we're in the very early stages. I'm really excited. We launched our academy on September 19th. Hmm. So I'm thinking come January, we can really start to look. Uh, I want to look at all the data now, but I don't want to get too, <laughs> I don't know if that's uh, uh, appropriate or accurate at this point, but those are some of the, the key things we want to look at. Um, but we have so much excitement in our company and our organization and our revenue org, customer success org. And even just the anecdotal feedback right now is really helpful. Customer hmm. feedback. Um, we do the typical two or three question evaluation at the end of our training. And I think the questions we go with are uh, kind of an NPS question. And uh, would you recommend, you know, the training? Uh, I feel like there's one more I'm missing at the moment, mm. but you can see the gist of it where we're heading. Yeah. yeah. You, the metric you were talking about earlier of um, trained clients versus clients that didn't take the training and, yeah. and, uh, and then the metric of uh, measuring the, the support tickets. Um, Qual it's also an opportunity for qualitative, right? Like, it's not just that someone's sending a support ticket in because they might have found a bug, but are the folks who didn't take the training actually sending in questions that the training answered? Or are they also revealing things that give you an opportunity to improve the, the training, which ties us right into the whole ADDIE model, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, in yeah. evaluation and then back to the beginning and, and, uh, and, and improve, et cetera. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Our support team we have a great relationship with. They are absolutely a, an input. We meet with them on a monthly basis. We review tickets and trends and say, you know, of what you're hearing of all the, the tickets and trends, are we already addressing some of these things in training or what can we what can we add in to help out? So, yeah, they're one of our many, many inputs for sure. Yeah. And they also I mean, they're reading literally what someone's, <laughs> you know, exactly. yeah, if they're typing yeah. in all caps, that's might not that, you know, that's a qualitative yeah. measurement, isn't it? <laughs> if yeah. you use certain well, kinds of words in their support ticket. Yeah, uh, it's funny you say that because we we had a question early on. We said, you know, if it, the support team is such a, a proponent and advocate of our academy team, should they or could they in all of their support tickets recommend training? So, all right, Chris, you submitted a ticket. You clearly don't know how to do something or you had a question. Should we say that's a great question, Chris? By the way, here's the training that you should go take to learn that. But that comes across a little almost passive aggressive. So we've had yeah. to navigate that yeah, yeah. kind of careful. Instead, we're using like an email signature that says, check out the Academy. If you haven't seen that, you know, here's the answer to your question. So that was an interesting one to, to tiptoe around without coming across the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. We've not, not dissimilar some, you know, some things um, uh, like that as, as well, where actually, yeah, the email signature from our support team always includes the link to the, to the community with a, you know, just a little, Hey, lots of answers and info here without exactly. saying, uh, you know, just, to, just to point people. Cause even, you know, lots of folks start up and don't even know all of the resources that, uh, sure. you know, that we do provide and helping them just even discover that sometimes. So. Neat. Yeah. I feel, I feel like I need to circle back. I can answer Peter. He says, uh, he says, mm. Brent, I'll disagree with your comment that <laughs> training as a product is more generic and you don't know your audience in my current role. We have to figure out our audience and build targeted training in order to have any success in the market. And yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Peter. I, I think that's why I, 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 I don't know. I probably wasn't too clear on it, but I think I think in some cases when you're building a product, you're you're absolutely right. You do know exactly the type of people, who they are, the job they need to do, and you can you can sell into that type of a market. And then there's that other kind of off-the-shelf training that is super generic like mm. i don't know let's pick any of them sexual harassment training uh you know um uh you know any sort of legal training yeah, the, management the management leadership yeah disciplinary stuff uh, how to have an effective meeting mm -hmm. like like stuff that is super generic content because every single organization needs it for one reason or another you know but if you go too generic, it's not really that effective and it's not specific. So yeah, there's, you know, I hate to fall back on it as such a cop out, but um, it depends is my answer for everything. <laughs> so, so. Well, and I, I would imagine there's often organizational specifics or policies or, or ways of working that are very, very targeted or specific to that organization. So yeah, I get, mm -hmm. I get that. 
Yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. Yeah, very sure. There's. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Well, I was just I was just going to say uh, it sounds BJ like you're absolutely loving uh, the new role, but come on, there's there's got to have been a problem or two that we can talk about. <laughs> uh, I think a problem or two. I would say um, two things. One is when I was brought into the role, I walked in. So this, I got to start this team from scratch. We had no LMS, no official training, and I had to hire my team, which was really exciting. That's fun. Yeah. Very exciting. And when I joined, I found that there were, and I'm only a little bit exaggerating, that there were about 15 to 20 versions of our LaunchDarkly 101 training created around the company by different people at different times that were off training customers in 15 different ways. Mm. And here I was, new person, didn't know much about the product, with a new team that didn't know a ton. And here we had to kind of wrangle that. And right, it's okay. taken some time. And one of the, I did something really amazing on accident, kind of <laughs> on accident, in that one of the, uh, one of the technical curriculum developers that we hired, I have, I have an incredibly strong team, but one of our curriculum developers um, mentioned in her interview that she and her team previously at her, at her past company used LaunchDarkly. And she came in with that knowledge that has proven to be amazing and wonderful and, and really mm -hmm. propelled us with the rest of the team's help. So uh, that helped a lot. So we had to wrangle those 15 versions and assure people that, hey, we're going to build something that will take this off your hands. You'll be proud of it. You won't have to maintain it. And that was just a lot of like, you know, care and feeding and, and relationship building and things like that. And now... And, and and, and a sense of um, like reassurance because there's also going to be a sense of ownership by all those yeah. because they took time and effort into it totally. and uh, you know for sure so there's that uh, like you say relationship building the reassurance the yeah. Um, yeah yeah that was a big one and then really getting alignment and I wouldn't even say we're 100 percent there but getting alignment on all right if we're going to come out with positioning and say here's what we're going to recommend in our training for it you're really coming down to like best practices for the company and that has impacts on how people use the product. Um, what features they do or don't use, that kind of stuff. So we are, really have a, a voice that people are going to hear and listen to, and we want to make sure that that is triangulated and approved by all these teams. I ended <laughs> up creating, um, we kept hearing all these different kind of opinions from echoes around the organization, and we got really worried that we were going to put something out there and find out that we really ticked off some team. So we ended up creating uh, our content alignment team, the CAT team, and it has, it's about 15 people, and it has a single representative from those different key teams and we bring them together about once a month and we say here's the training that we have in the works you can read the scripts uh, or the outlines of the scripts if you have a strong opinion on any of these particular topics we need you to weigh in and voice your opinion this is your moment to get your your voice in otherwise here's what we're going to run with so we we put some process around it um, so i would mm. say just kind of alignment consensus and then accuracy across those teams was what we worked on Mm -hmm. It's nice. I always think about the um, the it, we mentioned kind of how nice it is to be enjoyed or to be liked uh, with the training that you create, right? And the training that you deliver. And uh, Chet asks a great question in the, the chat, mentioning similar. So, in shifting from internal to external training, how are you shifting your team's mindset from developing employees to being a business lever? I had a very, like I said, very fortunate shift in this particular role that this was building a team from scratch. So I was able to help set expectations from the beginning. And it was, I think, validation and, and showed these folks that I brought onto this team um, that the company wanted to invest in this team. And there was excitement around building some type of university academy, whatever we, we wanted to call it. So um, the team came in with that fresh mindset of, all right, we get to build this thing. Let's go. If you had to go through more of a substantial shift, that would take a little more change management, a little more bringing people across. But in my case, I was lucky to have that uh, pretty pretty cut and dry. Nice. It also sounds like um, did you did did any of? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, it it also sounds like um, other levels within the organization recognize what you're doing as part of the value, as opposed to in many cases things like training, etc., are seen as. Um, not core, you know, to the to the overall um, product yeah. and 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 such. 
Exactly. And, and not only do we have the support, um, we are seen as one of the, the secret ways that this software company can scale really well. Mm. Because if we build out this training, especially, uh, you know, most of it being online, and in, instead of each of our customer success managers having to train and spend all this time, they can spend their time on much more valuable moments of need, deeper questions, and just point mm. people to the academy. Uh, so yeah, the value is, is definitely seen and encouraged. We, we had a, a Slack message from our chief revenue officer. He was at a meeting in India with a customer and he said he was able to recommend our academy and he even sent us a screenshot of our academy up on the projector. And he said, I'm so excited to be able to point people to this as a resource. And how often flip that mm. to the flip that to the internal side. How often would you see a chief revenue officer like brag or take a picture of internal training? I mean, not to discredit because that's where I was for 15 years, but for like a fresh shift or perspective, it has yeah. been pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we often yeah. do end up having conversations here about trying to even just get the attention of, um, you know, uh, of, of folks at other levels, et cetera, to understand the impact that we can have when we're sure. doing internal stuff. So it's a it's definitely a different perspective to be seen as part of the the overall solution. Cool. When you were hiring your team, did um, did did you specifically look for people that had that external training experience, or did you have to, did you hire people who ha who came from that internal space and this was their first experience doing external, and you had to help kind of coach their mindset? I think it was a mix. Um, I didn't go into the hiring saying that it had to be somebody that had external experience um i think about half of the team did have that external experience half or more and uh and i saw that as a positive but it wasn't a deal breaker i i went based on um general knowledge of of learning instructional design content development i knew we would have me's willing to help us out i knew we would have a, a team to help us out the challenge or the more interesting part of hiring a team from scratch so i've got five team members was kind of supplementing or augmenting the different skill sets. So if I found somebody that was really strong in one particular area, facilitation or the partner side of the world, or maybe learning ops and, and tech in the back, side, back end, um, was as the people came into place, I would kind of reevaluate the team and say, all right, we're really strong in these areas. My next hire needs to also have this skill set. And it was like putting these puzzle pieces together mm -hmm. And, and fortunately, it's all worked out really, really well. But uh, I wouldn't say that I, I so for, for people that might be considering moving from internal to external, um, no, I, in my case, I did not think that they had to have external experience to come onto a team like this. Hmm. Neat. Yeah. And it's nice that you were able to, it sounds like anyway, add pieces and then identify the additional pieces that, uh, that would supplement and, and augment. That's nice. The timing was fortunate, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, you have you have a large pool of uh, potential employees in uh, in your area. You know, uh, San Diego, Silicon Valley area, the California area. When I was trying to do the same thing in Phoenix, it was really hard to find yeah. anybody that yeah. I could hire when I was when I was building a team from scratch, and I had to completely punt and just look for people that I saw had potential. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. You know, it. You, you, you've got potential to be a trainer. You maybe haven't trained in this area, or maybe you've got just one experience doing training, but you're very excited about the opportunity. You got a lot of tech chops and you're for really sure. in, into shifting your role maybe into training. And so, yeah, I pulled a couple people in like that, nice. Um, nice. you know, just, uh, you know, just, just to get, people in and get the training going. So yeah, it was a, it was a very different experience for me, but I don't want to derail yeah. us on that. But yeah, that, yeah. that hiring thing and building a team, it's not easy. It, it takes a, a lot of time, a lot of interviewing. We're, we're fortunate that we are fully remote. So I have team members from Florida to Arizona, Montana, Idaho, nice. California, all over. So, you know, I had the pool of talent across the United States. However, not many folks had heard of Launch Darkly. Right now, we're at about 600 employees, um, but as of seven months ago, we weren't quite even that big. So it was more of like I had this talent pool, but I had to make this sell of like, "Hey, check out this company. Come to us. We're cool." You know, that kind of thing. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Part of the part of the fun of figuring it all out.
Oh, for sure. You know. Mm-hmm. Any uh, any any final words of wisdom for folks as we start to get towards the yeah. end? You know, if if somebody's looking to make the leap, or like I said when we first launched off, you know, maybe they've just been laid off. They're not too sure what to do. They're think maybe they see a job that's customer training. Like, what what do you recommend for folks? So I would say if it's if the external customer education side is even remotely appealing, there's a few things I would do. I would go out and just do a lot of searching and um, and reviewing of a lot of these external sites and and customer education sites. Almost every tech company or large company has some form of an external presence when it comes to like a a university academy, whatever you want to call it. Take a look at those, look at their offerings, look at the type of content that they're creating. Um, that was part of the research that I did before accepting the role at LaunchDarkly. I basically pulled together a Google Doc of about 20 different academies and universities and really just looked at them and just researched them and thought like, is this a world that I want to play in? Is this interesting to me? Um, how technical or, or not do I want to be? And what's appealing, what's interesting? Uh, there's a book that I recommend called Customer Education by Adam Avramescu, and it's just a great book on, you know, making that switch. I, I should say the book isn't necessarily about making the switch, but it's a full rundown of sure. all the things to consider in the customer education world. Um, I would say read the first like half or two thirds of that book to get a really good dose of what it looks like. The last part of the book gets into, if I remember right, more of the instructional design concepts and principles, which this audience should probably you know, have a, a grasp on, I would, I would guess. But yeah, I think do a little research and just poke around. And I am absolutely available for questions or chatting through ideas. Uh, I, I'd be happy to chat with anyone. But it's, it's been a really good switch for me. I would say absolutely consider it as an option because the skills absolutely transfer over to the external side. And that's perfect. And I'll... Uh... Start. Hey, there's the music I with new it. graphics <laughs> and coffee and coffee. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, yeah, thanks, BJ. I really appreciate you showing up. It was so good to see you yeah. and to get you on the show and reconnect. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Great to see you. Great to be here. Enjoyed the chat. Yeah. And as we get ready to dance on out of here, um, thanks as always to the folks in the chat. Don't forget, uh, we every week we make this happen because uh, of the sponsorship of Domino Learning Systems, where Brent and I both work. So I've tossed a link into the chat there if that's of interest to, to anybody looking for help or change in the authoring tool choices that they make. Thanks so much, okay. BJ. Thanks so much for your time today. It's been awesome. And uh, Thank you. look forward to having everybody again next week. Indeed. And don't forget to join us in the LinkedIn group as well as, uh, as we're dancing on out of here. I'll drop a link for that as well for anybody that's new. Mm-hmm. And we've got more great guests coming up. Hope everybody has a great week. See you next week. Adios. Adios, everybody.